This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. On April 20th of 2023, SpaceX conducted its first integrated flight test of the Starship and Super Heavy booster. This was a monumental achievement for the Starship program, even though they failed to reach orbit on their first attempt. For the most part, I think we can all agree that during this test, Starship performed much better than expected. But one could argue that there were also a few opportunities for improvement. As you all know, it took nearly 15 seconds for Starship to clear the pad, and by the time it did, Booster 7 managed to completely annihilate the blast surface under the orbital launch mount. This outcome made it painfully clear that a flat concrete pad located 16 meters below the vehicle would not be enough to support 33 Raptor engines operating at full thrust. While they didn't expect the results to be as severe as they were, SpaceX was well aware of this fact beforehand. We know this because at the time, they were already more than six months into developing a new system that could fight back against the world's largest blowtorch. Fast forwarding to the present day, it's been just over two months since the Starship integrated flight test and crews have been working 24 seven to install a massive water-cooled steel blast surface ahead of the next launch attempt. As of now, SpaceX is finally nearing the first major milestone in this process, which is to repair the foundation of the orbital launch mount. In today's episode, we're going to take an in-depth look into how SpaceX is accomplishing this retrofit while building around the existing systems. If you're looking for the How It's Made episode of Stage Zero 2.0, then you've come to the right place. My name is Zach Golden, and welcome to another CSI Starbase Deep Dive Investigation. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. On the 19th of May, SpaceX shared this footage demonstrating a proof of concept of their new protection system for the orbital launch mount. The goal of this transpirationally cooled steel sandwich is to maintain a layer of water between the exhaust plume and the steel plates in order to prevent them from melting or disintegrating. This seems to work very well during the single engine test. But with all 33 engines firing, there will still be a tremendous amount of force transferred into the ground through the steel plates. For this system to be successful, the foundation used to support it will need to be significantly stronger than the original design in order to prevent the same thing from occurring again. As always, before we get started, I want to quickly define a few terms that are going to be repeated frequently throughout this episode. Since we are going to be discussing foundation repair work, we need to understand the main components that make up the foundation of this structure. These components include concrete pilings, a blinding layer, and finally the pile cap. Let's start with the concrete piles. In civil engineering and construction, piles are long cylindrical structural elements which can be made of steel, timber, or in this case, concrete. They are used to transfer loads from the above ground structure into the deeper layers of soil or rock. These are especially useful in situations where the existing subsoil layer near the surface does not possess sufficient bearing capacity to support the structure. Next, there is the blinding layer, which refers to a thin layer of concrete or mortar that is placed over the prepared ground before constructing the foundation. The purpose of this blinding layer is to provide a clean and level surface for subsequent construction work. The blinding layer also has a secondary purpose of distributing the loads from the structure to the underlying soil and preventing the upward movement of groundwater. Finally, there is the pile cap, which is a reinforced concrete slab or structural element that connects and supports a group of piles. It's constructed on top of the blinding layer and is used to evenly distribute the loads from the superstructure onto the individual piles. Now that we have a common understanding of these terms, let's take a look at the process for constructing this new, massively upgraded foundation. The first step of this process was to excavate all of the old material from under the orbital launch mount. This includes getting all of the damaged pilings out of the way and removing any debris that was left over from the failed blast surface. During this time, Water was constantly being removed from under the OLM using several pumps. After the excavation process was complete, they backfilled the area with sand and gravel in order to prepare for the new auger pilings. There were two separate types and sizes of pilings used under and around the orbital launch mount. These were installed in three separate zones and each of these zones serves a different purpose. First, we have what are known as rotary board pilings, or RBP for short. 
These piles are started off by drilling a shallow hole into the ground and then lowering a steel casing into the hole. These casings varied in length, but they were all about 4 feet or 1.2 meters in diameter. After this, the casings are driven into the ground using a vibrohammer. The primary purpose of this casing is to prevent the shallow layers of subsoil from collapsing into the hole. As a secondary function, it is also used as a guide for the auger as it bores the remaining hole roughly 35 meters down to its final depth. Once this is complete, huge rebar cages are carefully lowered into the hole, and then it is filled with concrete. After the concrete has cured to an acceptable level, the above ground section of the casing is cut away from the concrete piling. There were eight of these RBP pilings arranged in a circular pattern, with one more in the center for a total of nine. These are also used to provide support for the direct blast surface. The original design featured 24 auger pilings instead of nine. However, these are a larger diameter and likely much deeper as well. There are 15 more of these RBP pilings installed outside of the original tension band of the foundation. The placement of these piles creates a bit of an odd pattern. In general, we would expect it to be somewhat symmetrical considering there is an equal amount of high pressure exhaust gases escaping in all six directions coming from under the orbital launch mount. Unfortunately, there are a few obstacles in the way of designing a symmetrical base. I'm referring to the concrete trenches that straddle the launch mount on the eastern and western sides. Originally, I expected that when this job was performed, SpaceX would end up temporarily cutting into and removing sections of these ground support equipment trenches. This actually was done on the eastern side of the launch mount, but likely because these pipes were damaged during the launch event, so they needed to be replaced either way. Had they done this on the opposite side, we would have probably ended up seeing two RBP piles placed symmetrically between each of the legs for a total of 12 piles. The problem with cutting into the culvert on this side is that there are three times as many cryogenic and high pressure gas pipes in here that feed not only the launch mount, but the integration tower as well. It appears that SpaceX was unwilling to break into this culvert, which is understandable, because it would have probably added a lot of difficulty to the project and increased the amount of time it takes to get this orbital pad operational again. As a result, they were unable to place large RBP piles between these two legs. To compensate for this, they placed two additional piles in this direction and three on this side. Some of you are probably wondering how additional supports on these sides makes up for having zero support in this area, and that's a very good question. But we will return to that here in a bit. While we are on the topic of strong foundations, I know there are a lot of you out there who are trying to start your own business, but are missing the foundation you need to get it off the ground. Having a powerful website to showcase your products, services, or portfolio can be the launch pad you need to take your ideas to the next level. This is why we're excited to partner with Squarespace again for today's episode. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that offers an amazing website builder with customizable templates and cutting-edge marketing tools to help you revolutionize your online presence. One of the standout features of Squarespace is its user-friendly interface. Designed for those without any prior coding or website design experience, this platform's intuitive drag and drop editor makes building and updating your website quick and easy. Matter of fact, you can probably have it done before SpaceX finishes installing the upside down shower head under the orbital launch mount. All Squarespace templates are fully responsive, ensuring that your website displays optimally across various devices, including desktops, tablets, and mobile phones. Right now, they have a great offer for subscribers of this channel. All you have to do is head over to squarespace.com slash CSI Starbase, and you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You can find the link to that in the description below. All right, returning to the orbital launch mount. Let's quickly discuss the second type of piling used here, which is known as a continuous flight auger piling, or CFA pile for short. CFA piles use an auger similar to what is used in the RBP pilings, except there is a hollow tube in the center of the drill bit. This allows concrete, or grout, to be pumped through the center. In this method, the hole is drilled all the way to the desired depth, and then the concrete is pumped into the hole as the auger is withdrawn. From here, the reinforcement cage is quickly lowered into the pile while the concrete remains fluid. From what we have been able to locate so far, there are 11 of these CFA piles scattered around the launch pad area. These are much smaller than the 24 RBP piles and are around 18 inches, or half a meter in diameter. All 11 CFA piles are located outside of what we will consider to be the foundation of this structure. This means that they are probably being used as anchors for the concrete outside of the base structure and should prevent large slabs of concrete from being ripped free, similar to what we observed in the aftermath of the integrated flight test. We believe there is a chance that there are additional CFA piles in some of these open areas that haven't been uncovered yet. 
But as it currently stands, it seems that the locations were chosen almost at random due to the fact that there are still large areas of unsupported concrete. In my opinion, there is a chance that these may not even be necessary at all if the water-cooled steel plates under the launch mount perform as well as anticipated. Anyways, the next step in this process was to excavate all of the backfill material that was brought in prior to the installation of the auger piles. For this, SpaceX needed to dig down nearly 15 feet or 4 meters from the height of the original blast surface. Digging this deep into the ground puts the bottom of the excavated area roughly 2 meters below the local water table, which creates a bit of a challenge for the construction process. The biggest issue is dealing with the water that will seep in from below the surface. But there is also a possibility of water entering through the sides, which could cause instability in the subsoil surrounding the excavated area. Preventing this from occurring required a two-step solution. The first was to create a watertight perimeter around the entire foundation of the launch mount. This was accomplished by installing walls of sheet pilings into the ground to enclose most of the area. Sheet pilings are long, corrugated steel panels which are designed to interlock with each other. This helps to keep the water-saturated perimeter walls from collapsing into the excavated area, but it's not enough to prevent groundwater from rising to the surface. For this, a dewatering system was installed along the perimeter of the barrier wall several weeks before the excavation work would take place. This type of dewatering system is known as a well point system. There are several ways of installing a system like this, but in this case, a hollow pipe is drilled about 6 meters into the ground using a small drilling rig. This is similar to what you would use if you were attempting to take a core sample, except there is a water jet in the center of the pipe that displaces all of the sand and soil as it's being cut away. This creates a water-filled hole in the ground. After this, a riser or well point, which is essentially a PVC pipe with a small opening on one end, is lowered into the hole. Then a filler material is added between the pipe and the wellbore. This holds the pipe in place and also acts as a filter. Shout out to Starship Gazer for capturing this footage to help us explain this process. Once the network of well points are installed, they are connected to a larger pipe manifold using collection hoses. This manifold is connected to an external pump, which is used to pull a partial vacuum on the tubes. The suction force will extract the water from out of the ground while leaving the sand in place. This dewatering system is an effective method of temporarily lowering the water table several meters below its natural depth. This ensures that the excavated area doesn't turn into a giant swimming pool. Anyways, with the dewatering system doing its job, SpaceX was able to proceed with the excavation work. As they were removing all of the material, they also demolished the original hexagonal tension band between five of the legs. As you all know, good old Booster 7 handled the first one. The concrete was completely removed, but several meters of rebar were left intact on either side, which would later allow them to be tied in with the reinforcement cages for the new foundation. As I mentioned earlier, all of the casings for the RBP pilings had been cut away, leaving the tops of the columns exposed. Each of these will have to be cropped down to the height of the eventual blinding layer. I've explained this before in a previous episode, but using a cropping machine like the one shown in this example, the concrete can be pulled free while leaving the rebar intact. After this, the rebar is cut down below the height of the future pile cap. Just like the demolished tension bands, this will be used to tie into the massive pile cap. With the concrete piles cropped down to the proper level, the first half of the blinding layer was set. This concrete base covers the north side of the base structure and also the entire surface under the launch mount. We aren't sure whether or not they ever completed the remainder of this blinding layer, or if they went straight into laying down rebar on the south side of the structure. The density of these layers of rebar makes it nearly impossible to tell whether or not there is concrete underneath it. Moving ahead to the present week, we can finally see the full shape of the pile cap. On the south side of the pile cap, you can see that there is actually two separate tiers for the rebar formwork. Looking at the lower level, which is where all of the pipe manifolds will rest, you can see a gap in the formwork which will create a ditch for a large water pipe to run underneath another part of the manifold. Thanks to Ryan Hansen Space, we can see what this will look like. There are two separate pipes that will feed the water-cooled plates under the launch mount. When we move around to the north side of the OLM, we can see that there is only a single tier of rebar cages. Without a step down in the concrete, it seems unlikely that there will be any water supply manifolds on this side of the launch mount. Those of you who are returning viewers to the channel will remember that we initially expected the water supply to encircle the launch mount, passing under the GSE pipework that runs up the leg on the west side of the structure. This would have supplied water from all six sides, which is how the equivalent system at Pad 39A was designed. But that is clearly not the case considering SpaceX has already begun reinstalling the cryotubes 
and they appear to be forming the foundation around the pipes instead of replacing the preformed U-shaped concrete culverts. This means that we should not expect to see any supply manifolds feeding the water-cooled steel plates on this side of the launch mount. With the way this system has been designed, or possibly redesigned, the three manifolds on the south side of the table will send water across the blast surface to supply the sides that don't have manifolds. In order to mount these massive steel plates, there needs to be a way of anchoring them to the foundation. So while these rebar cages are being laid, several cranes have been busy placing steel embeds on top of the rebar cages. An embed is a steel plate that typically has studs welded to one side. This is the side that is embedded into the rebar cage and will later become part of the concrete structure. They are used as an interface between the concrete and structural steel members. On the top side of these plates can either be a flat surface for welding or threaded studs to allow structural members to bolt down onto the surface. There are square embed plates placed in various locations in the lower tier, which are likely for attaching brackets that will be used to support the pipe manifolds. There are also significantly larger U-shaped embed sections, which is where the water-cooled steel plates will actually rest on. These are placed between each of the six legs to form a pattern like this. The edges of the steel sandwich will rest on top of these embeds, which will give them a surface to weld them in place. You can see that there is a different design for the positions where the water manifolds will be located. So, with the remaining formwork installed around the perimeter of the lower level, they were able to begin the first half of this massive concrete job. The bottom layer of this foundation is about 1.8 meters thick, and the top layer is 2.2 meters. So, this job had to be divided into two sections. Starting at 10 p.m. on June 25th and continuing over a period of 10 hours and 47 minutes, 132 mixer trucks were used to deliver just over 1,000 cubic meters of high-strength concrete. This number is assuming that each mixer truck has a capacity of 7.6 cubic meters. We expect the second layer will require about 858 cubic meters, so that will be an additional 113 loads. For those of you who are wondering, this is roughly 4,600 tons of concrete and enough to fill three quarters of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Overall, this is a drastic upgrade from the original foundation. Looking back at it one more time, in the original design, the actual foundation was the six piles that tie into each of the legs and the tension band that joins them together. In the center of the pad was the blast surface, which in my opinion was a completely separate structure because it didn't actually tie into the tension band or the six columns. As we mentioned, the blast surface was formed using 24 CFA pilings, and there was a concrete pile cap that was about 18 to 36 inches thick, and on top of that was 8 to 12 inches of Fondag RS. I'm not certain of these numbers, but this is what I was able to determine by examining the debris that was left over after the launch. As we covered in our deep dive investigation into the aftermath of this flight test, SpaceX was essentially relying on this layer of Fondag to protect the concrete pile cap underneath. The expected mode of failure here would have been for the booster to burn through the layer of Fondag and then destroy the pile cap, but that is not what ended up occurring. Instead, the pile cap failed first as it bent under the force of the stagnation pressure from the Raptor engines. Had the blast surface been structurally tied into the foundation, there's a good chance that the outcome would have been much different. This time around, the nine pilings under the blast surface, six original pilings for the leg columns, and 15 perimeter piles are all tied together to form a massive foundation capable of redistributing the expected load across a much greater surface area than before. The next step after this will be to install the upside down shower head. At this point, we have only seen about half of the water-cooled plates that will be involved in the system. In the weekly flowers from RGB aerial photos, we have seen the rectangular plates for the three sides of the blast surface that will have water manifolds attached to them. We have also found three of the six trapezoids that will make up the ring around the central hexagon. But we still have not seen the plates for the three remaining sides, which will not have a direct water supply, nor have we found the triangular sections that will be located in the center of the pad. We believe all of these missing sections are currently hidden inside of this inventory tent at the Sanchez site. Looking through the open doorway, we have been able to see at least one or two of these plates being worked on inside of here, but that is only a fraction of what is missing and we can't even say for certain which pieces we are viewing, although they do appear to be the rectangular sections we are looking for. The only problem is that this piece has large holes on the end of it, which are threaded as if pipes will later be fit into those positions. But from our current understanding, whoa, what the f Okay, so time out. As I'm recording this episode, it appears that SpaceX has just removed the sidewall of this inventory tent, and we're finally able to see what's on the inside. 
Shout out to Starship Gazer for capturing this footage because this fills in a lot of blanks for us. As you can tell, it appears that the centerpiece for the system has been welded together as one massive section. This was quite unexpected, but it should drastically reduce the amount of time it takes to install this system once it's ready. Give me a few minutes, I'm gonna see if Ryan can put something together for us. All right, thanks to some quick work from Ryan Hansen Space, we can see what this massive section looks like when viewed from above. By the looks of it, there are still at least three missing sections that will end up resting on top of these embed plates. It'll be interesting to see how SpaceX is able to maneuver something this large under the launch deck. There is zero chance of this being lowered in through the top of the launch mount, even with the clamps retracted. Because of this, it will actually have to be transported in vertically between two of the legs, using this custom transport stand. From there, it can carefully be lifted into position from above. This is an extremely tight fit, so it will take some finessing to get it into position. Because this was a rather last minute development, we will cover it more in depth in part two of this deep dive investigation. While we wait for the next steps to be completed, let's check in with the other component of this system, which SpaceX has been making a lot of progress on. As a lot of you are aware by now, the high pressure water system is located on the opposite side of the integration tower from the orbital launch mount. Four water supply tanks were installed shortly before the integrated flight test. These were delivered to Starbase in February of this year, along with several large sections of pipe and these two manifold pieces right here. We initially believed that these were intended to control the flow of water to the deluge system. These have since disappeared and have likely been scrapped, so it's possible that they were never part of the design. However, it wouldn't really make sense to transport them all the way from Florida to Texas just to end up scrapping them. So we do believe that there was some sort of change in plans. In place of where we expected these manifolds to be located, they installed two even larger water tanks next to the original set of four. There is space for a third tank and the pedestal is already on site, so we believe an additional one will be transported across the country in the coming weeks. These tanks were originally used as vertical storage tanks in their past life, so there is a bit of modification work that will need to be performed. In particular, they will be installing large flanges onto the bottom of the tanks, similar to what exists on the first group. These flanges will connect to a four foot diameter manifold that runs along the larger five foot diameter pipe for the four smaller tanks. So as you can tell, there are two separate water supplies feeding the water cooled plates, which gives this the appearance of a two stage water system, although we are unsure if that's actually the case. One interesting thing to note is that the larger storage tanks have a smaller discharge manifold than the first group of tanks. For this reason, it seems like the smaller water tanks are meant to be emptied in a rather quick burst, lasting just a few seconds while the larger tanks could be a secondary water supply for longer duration tests. As of now, SpaceX has begun to assemble the high pressure gas discharge manifold, which would be used to split the gas supply between the two groups of water tanks. As you can see with the first group of tanks, the gas is injected through a port in the top, which forces the water out at the bottom. The flow of gas into the water tanks, and likely the pressure as well, are regulated by the number of valves open on this manifold. After the water leaves the tanks, it turns upwards into what is known as a weir pipe. At the apex of this weir, there is a small pipe that branches off from the top, which is likely an anti-siphoning vent. This system is still incomplete at this point, so we will hold off on explaining how all of this works for now. There are a large number of high pressure gas tanks sitting off to the side, which are yet to be installed, as well as several other components, which I believe are still missing from this area. With that being said, we will pick up where we left off in part two of this deep dive investigation. If you enjoyed this episode, then do us a favor and hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and check out some of our recent investigations that you may have missed. This is our 20th episode and we're hoping to finally hit 50,000 subscribers. If you'd like to support the channel and help us continue to be able to produce this type of content, you can do so by becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon or by joining as a member of the channel. Patrons and members receive ad-free versions of these episodes and can also gain access to the CSI Starbase Discord server. I want to say a huge thank you to all of our current members, because without you, we seriously wouldn't be able to do this. Before we go, I also want to thank all the photographers and 3D artists whose content was used in today's investigation. You can find the links to all of their various platforms in the description. Last but not least, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's episode. I hope to see you all on part two of this deep dive investigation. For now, this is Dave Zero Zach, signing off.